Yeah. You know, how would you I just... just... I would just say that it was easy. I mean, things made sense for the most part. And when they didn't make... Or when things were then wrong, there was a... It was obvious to everybody that there was a problem. Like, it's not like now when things are glaringly, glaringly wrong and people are trying to have a discussion about why it's not that bad. So it's pretty easy. We didn't have... I mean, my entire house had, I think, one air conditioning. One, I think. I mean, they were just not very... It was just pretty simple living, but pretty... But a strong sense of community. Um, campus was safe. We had no walls. So kind of walk, stroll to people's houses, stroll back. I mean, the funny things we did as kids is a friend would come to visit. I walk her to her house. She walked me back to my house. I walk her back to her house. And when it's now dark, we all of both of us will now receive sense. And we now stop in the middle and she will go to her house and I will go from my house. Welcome to a new episode of the Onside News Podcast. Today we are joined by a remarkable force in Nigerian civil activism, Yeni Adam Lekum, Dynamic Executive Director of Enough is Enough Nigeria Foundation. With an amazing commitment to fostering good governance and public accountability, Yeni and her team at the EIE have pioneered the transformative ISVP campaign, revolutionizing voters' education and civic participation in Nigeria. Their efforts in spearheading the Open National Assembly campaign has been pivotal in bringing in transparency in the National Assembly, truly embodying the spirit of the Office of the Citizen Campaign. Yet this influence extends far beyond these campaigns. As a key player in the Bring Back and the Girls movement, their dedication to the safety and rights of Nigerian citizens is undeniable. With a rich 23 year career that straddles the public and private sectors, across the U.S. and Nigeria. The Nigeria is one of passion, dedication, and undying drive for change. Recognized as one of the most influential people of African descent and a global citizen's prize winner, her expertise and insights have shaped policies and inspired many. Raised at the intellectual environment of the University of Ife, an educator at the University of Virginia, London School of Economics, and Oxford University State Business School, Yemi's academic prowess in mathematics, economics, and developmental studies underpins her strategic approach to activism. Today, she joins us to share her profound insights and experiences. Let's dive into a conversation that promises not just to enlighten, but to ignite a spark of change in each of us. Stay tuned as we explore today's active citizenship and religious pursuits of a just and developed Nigeria with Jimmy Adam Oleko. Let's go. Uh, so, um, let's see. So you grew up uh, at Obafemiolo, uh, uh, OAU, Obafemiolo University, prior to uh, the University of Lagos. Um, yes, then University of Ife, but yes. Then University of Ife, Greater Ife. So what extent did the atmosphere at the university shape your passion as an activist for good governance? Particularly, I mean, indirectly, I would say, because I keep telling people that there's a generation of children that grew up on the campus of first-generation universities. I mean, I can certainly speak for Ibadan and Ife, um, who have a certain worldview, and not only a certain worldview, but also a bond that, that connects us, that has connected us over the decades. Ife, for me, is particularly interesting because in Ife, the only thing you had was university and the Oni's palace. I mean, Oni being symbolic uh, for Yorubas and, and holding that place. The Oni, the palace, people who came in as tourists, Ife was associated with that. But the only other thing was university. So we grew up in a place that was literally in the middle of nowhere, that had nothing but the university. But for a certain generation, a bunch of kids came out who literally believed they could do anything. And this was not because of they were particularly exposed in real terms, but they were exposed through books. They were exposed through experiences. I mean, those who traveled when their parents went on sabbatical. But there was something just about that environment that made you believe that your environment was not a limiting factor and that you could do and be anything. I mean, if you look at people who are, as we call them, campus kids, that lived in Ife at a certain 
spanned a certain generation. They're doing amazing things. Everybody from Carl Toriola, who's the current CEO of MTN in Nigeria, to Jumoke Adenowo, who is a celebrated architect, to several people who have served in different capacities as commissioners, people who are working for Microsoft, people who have gone on to do pretty incredible things. Um, there's just something about Ife. So for me as an activist, I'm not sure that there was, I would say that there was a direct correlation. But my father was a, uh, or is a professor of public administration. So discussions around governance, politics, Nigeria were pretty standard in my house. That's interesting. So what would you say generally growing up like was, how would you describe growing up like at, at Ife then? I know you kind of touched on it already, but yeah. you know, how would you I would just, just... I would just say that it was easy. I mean, things made sense for the most part. And when they didn't make... Or when things were then wrong, there was a... It was obvious to everybody that there was a problem. Like, it's not like now when things are glaring, glaringly wrong and people are trying to have a discussion about why it's not that bad. So it's pretty easy. We didn't have... I mean, my entire house had, I think, one air conditioning one i think i mean they were just not very it was just pretty simple living but pretty but a strong sense of community um campus was safe we had no walls so kind of walk stroll to people's houses stroll back i mean the funny things we did as kids is a friend would come to visit i walk her to her house she walked me back to my house i walk her back to her house and when it's now dark we all of both of us will now receive sense and when I stop in the middle, and she will go to her house, and I will go from her house. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know of anywhere in, even in Ife campus today. I'm not even sure these kids can still do that because visiting things have just changed ridic ridiculously. There are now goats and chicken roaming around the place. Maybe not goats, but at least chickens. People are rearing animals. Um, people are digging wells because we had water. Like everybody had piped water. Uh, people are now digging wells in campus. I mean, just so that dynamic of things, you open your tap, water comes out, you have lights, then they started taking lights, which was a general Nigerian problem. But yeah, I mean, things would spoil and you would call maintenance and they'll come and fix it. That was the community. And it made sense. That's why I say it makes sense. I always tell people, if you are in Nigeria, I want to understand how university campuses were at a certain point in time. Go to IITA in Ibadan. IITA's layout is very much campus-like. And because, I mean, they're foreign-owned, they still have money to run it and maintain it. It'll give you a sense of what university campuses should be like. Hmm. IIT is the International Tropical um, Institute, right? Yeah, Institute wrong. of Tropical Agriculture, yes. Tropical Agriculture, okay. I have a, I know a couple of people that work there right now, oh, classmates okay. actually. Yeah. Nice. Very interesting. Um, has there any other things you would say influence you to embrace social mobilization and change, if any? I think, I mean, fundamentally, maybe you're right. If I go back to your question, the one thing that Ife kind of embedded in my brain is that Nigeria can work. So kind of watching Nigeria take a detour, moving to Lagos, there's always just that sense that I, as a person, deserve better. I've seen better, and I deserve better. And there's no reason why I can't have better, especially because the people who are in leadership positions are fellow Nigerians. They don't have two heads. They are not from us. They are not aliens. They're fellow Nigerians like myself. And I refuse to give them the privilege to make life difficult for me. So we, are going to, we will have a conversation about it. And then secondly, I would say, and the second day, I would say my parents, as I said, my father, a professor of public administration, very clear. I mean, he easily, and this is the ongoing conversation now, there's a certain generation of them who understood how government should run, but chose to be academics and outside consultants rather than going into politics. And so that would, I would say that's his path. Uh, my mom died 21, 22 years ago, but hers was also more of an outside, I mean, her field was in nursing, counseling, that line of social work, that line of work. I joke now that my mother knew 30 years ago that Nigerians will need counseling now. So she, and unfortunately, she's not around now to give Nigerians counseling. All of us need, we're all on the spectrum. We all need counseling. But for, for me, watching her, even though she wasn't into politics or whatever, she was very clear about social justice issues. 
and very clear about not needing um, not needing a title or a position to lend her voice for what is right or wrong, or what is right rather, to, to right wrongs. Let me put it that way, yeah. So watching both of them growing up, I'm, I'm certainly had an impact on me subconsciously. Interesting. Um, did, by any chance, are you the only one in your family that ended up in this, just out of curiosity, uh, just ended up pursuing? Well, my immediate younger brother is probably the kindest, there are three of us, it's probably the kindest of the three of us. So when it comes to social justice, in his own way, yes, he's just not as vocal or as aluta-ish as I am. <laughs> you asked me about my siblings. I said my immediate younger brother is, uh, is the kindest, the three of us, is the kindest of the three of us. So his own sense of social justice is very present, but doesn't come out in the way mine does. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. No, that's good. Uh, so as the executive director um, of uh, Enough is Enough, it, um, do you think a critical mass of Nigerians share your, or are beginning to share your, your views on, on holding, holding uh, government accountable? I think so. I mean, they think they understand it at a theoretical level. Are they willing to do it is another conversation. If you think they're not willing to do it, why would you say that they're not willing? What do you think they're not willing to do it? Well, they haven't done it. So when they do it, then <laughs> there will be no need to guess. I, I can see you're, you're a very, as a matter of fact, person. So I think mathematics works for you, I guess. Yeah, it does. Two plus two is always equal to four. Two plus two. <laughs> well, it depends. It depends on who's asking. What? No, two plus is always equal to four, but I mean, there are levels of math that then change as math gets a bit more nuanced. So by the time I got to like my senior year, I was like, what is this? Can two plus two please equal to four? It's not what I signed up for, but yeah. Uh, okay. uh, um, what would you, uh, what would you say, do you, do you feel like Nigerians have a, any kind of principal objection to corruption and any abuses of office? Good question. I think, so, I mean, I'm a person of faith, and the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. And in other countries as well, I think people as, hum, as human beings will always, get, will always want to get away with whatever it is we can get away with if we don't get punished. And you see it in children. Like, children that have not really tasted life or see anything will push their boundaries, will push what it is, is what you say they shouldn't do, they'll kind of eye you and see if there's, is there any consequence if I disobey? And they'll test it. But they, they align when there are consequences. And then they realize that, yeah, daddy's not playing or mommy's not playing. And that then shapes their brain into what's good, what's bad, and also personal experience. I mean, if you put your hand in fire and it burns you, nobody needs to tell you that there are consequences. So with that sort of general frame of how human beings are wired, if there are no consequences for bad behavior, it becomes normal. And for me, that's what we see in Nigeria, such that the things we grew up with as abnormal are slowly become normal because that's what people are seeing. And so it's being perpetrated because there are no consequences. There are no push, there's no pushback. So is there a fundamental opposition to corruption? The number of people that innately oppose it, in my view, are getting smaller and smaller. But if you say if you if you see it that way, why is it? Why do you feel like? Uh, why would you? What would you say about the it, the norm in Nigeria of people becoming apologists? Or once something happens, it's always it's still a case of you know God bless this person, quote unquote. Um, what would you make of that? I don't understand the question. So in Nigeria, you have this phenomenon where no matter what happens. No matter the road people go down, people are willing to defend uh, the indefensible. To, to quote you or to quote you earlier on, you you have this um, whether is elections that are clearly uh, non-existent or cases of corruption, mismanagement, election declaration doesn't matter what it is. It would always seem that no matter what happens, Nigerians become general apologists or people you might expect that if they got if they get into government they would be different, but they are just pretty much even a, maybe, they're typically worse than the next person, the last people that came. That's something, if you notice, very Nigeria, that typically happens a lot. 
So what, what would you? So the question is, if you feel like um, people maybe need a certain, certain amount of structure to quote you, but why is it that one, the structure is not forthcoming, and two, what would you make of the phenomenon? This phenomenon that just um, no matter what happens, it's like anything goes to Nigeria. But I just explained it. If there are no consequences for bad behavior, it perpetuates. It's very simple. It's, and human, it's not Nigeria, it's human nature. That's why I went through the whole explanation of children and their parents. So you feel, so how, how would you, how would you, how, how do you think such consequences can come up? Do you feel having an organization like this is what can I bring consequences? There must be consequences that, that people feel. So one, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to get to is for the few people that still think bad things are bad is the fact that they need to speak up more and then have in their own sphere of influence reward good behavior and punish bad behavior because that's the only i mean that's the only way so institutions for example in my view that have huge sway in how that is framed in people's minds are religious institutions but even then you don't see them doing that so you see people that are known to be corrupt, sent in front row of churches because they are donating and the church doesn't frown at it. That reinforces the fact that even even the church will bless your stealing or will look the other way if you steal. So yeah, until the people that believe bad is bad and right good is good, speak up a bit more in their own spheres of influence, punish it for those who choose to go into government, uh, you can point at them and say that these people are upstanding or whatever it is that they choose to do in their own sphere of influence, then yeah, maybe we can begin to turn this ship around. That's interesting. That's a very, um, it's, 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 inter it's interesting. It, it comes that why, you, why is it it's interesting because it sounds, I don't know if it's, it borders more on hypothetical than it is like, is this to say that would mean, Hey, you would assume that these people have the foundation to do the right thing. Because inherently, you're also admitting that people inherently, if you don't give them consequences, they're going to inherently do the wrong thing. But that's human nature. It's not a Nigerian thing, number one. That's a statement of fact. So that's not a debatable point. Now, if I use religious institutions, for example, and the church, which is the one I'm most familiar with, it's embedded in your faith. What is wrong is wrong. You don't celebrate people who steal money. It's not a new thing. It's nobody's adding any layer of anything. It's not a novel thing that we're asking you to do. I'm simply asking you to do what it means to be a Christian. So if we're really and religious, Nigeria is incredibly religious. So if there's a challenge, and it's one of the things that a few people have started actually directly challenging the church about, especially a younger generation who might not carry as much of the social cultural baggage, in actually asking these questions. So why are we doing this? Why are we silent? Or the, a big thing is, for example, NSAS. Let me not say NSAS, a big thing. But a big thing is church members asking their church leaders why they are not responding to societal issues. Because it's scripture, it's Bible, it's biblical. So for me, that's the context. I'm not asking people to do what is outside of themselves. I'm asking them to do what you say is fundamental to who you are as an individual. That's part one. Part two, when I say for people who know better, there are people who still know that right is right and wrong. Like, yeah, right is right and wrong is wrong. Who are not um, carried away by the bandwagon and saying, trying to justify every bad thing. They know it. They're a bit more quiet. They, I mean, we see it on, on Twitter, for example. I'm, Twitter in Nigeria is very political. And we see it in fact that if you say clearly things that the mob don't agree with, they'll come for you. So a lot of people are now a lot more quiet. Don't don't share their views as much as they would because they can't deal with the Twitter mob, quote unquote. But part of it is being ready to just deal with them. And the easiest way to deal with the Twitter mob is to ignore them. You drop what you need to drop, do your commentary on what you think is right, wrong, and why, and keep it moving. If anybody wants to go and cap in your cap by being um, camp in your mentions. Let them go and do that. When they are bored, they will work out and go. I mean, I don't understand. So you do in your in your um, in your organization, you use a lot of media to disseminate the information. So how would you yourself say? How effective would you say that that is overall? It's been extremely effective. But again, but now, for example, for this year, it's one of the things my team and I are discussing. How do we want to use Twitter differently? Because Twitter has become very toxic. 
um, there's a, a branch of the obedient movement that's very toxic. There's a branch of APC. I mean, I have friends in APC and across all parties. The two strongest parties on social media, primarily political Twitter, are APC and and I'll call them, I won't even call them label because a lot of them don't associate with being labeled. They're just obedience. Now for APC, APC is very clear. APC understands media. They have a paid media machinery to push out propaganda and shape narrative. They've been doing it since they were in opposition. So they understand the game. And they understand how much social media was instrumental in them, in their voice and their narrative being amplified. So they know what to do. Obedience, on the other hand, are mostly young people, people who use technology, who happen to be part of the obedient movement. But there's no sort of central command and control that's shaping the narrative of this is what we want to push out because this is where we are going. So I see it's a bit more disjointed, not as controlled, but the toxicity is there because there's a general pain, a general bias, a general anger, a general frustration that they all share. And when I say obedience, I'm speaking generally, obviously, not everybody who identifies as an obedience is toxic. Let's just be clear. But they are very toxic obedience. So if you take those two camps and what they've done to Twitter, a lot of people have decided to kind of retreat. So I have a lot of my friends who consider themselves Twitter observers. So they're on Twitter. And five years ago, they'll be very active, engaging, talking, but now they don't talk. So what they'll do is they'll grab comments or grab threads. They will enter WhatsApp and will now discuss it in WhatsApp. The discussion we'll have done on Twitter before, we'll now do it in WhatsApp because nobody is trying to deal with any young 20-something-year-old with 200 followers trying to be commenting on what I'm talking about. So I see that a lot now. But so what my team and I are talking about, I mean, at the, I think we still do. We probably still have the largest followers on Twitter of any civil society organization in Nigeria. And saying that, okay, we got that because obviously we're planning protests and also engaging. How do we stay in on Twitter but shape conversation? So we're not concerned about your toxicity, but if you lie, we'll tell you you just lied and provide clear evidence of why you lied. If you now want to be abusing us, commenting, we'll leave you there to be doing that. But we want EIE's handle to be a safe space where people know that they can get the facts and we'll stick to that. We'll engage the people that want to engage and having a meaningful conversation. But if you just want to be stupid, we'll leave you to your stupidity. But yeah, I think but social media is critical because the role that it's played over the last 10 decade is give people a space to speak. Not everybody has access to TV. Not everybody can get in the newspaper article. And radio, a bit more accessible where you have to call in and pay attention to the times of the program, yada, yada, yada. But on Twitter, I can wake up at 2 a.m. and decide I want to throw a thread on why Tinubu is a crook. And I do it. I feel very good. And I go back to work. So, so <laughs> what you said, what you said, um, would you say... <laughs> Would you, do you do you guys have other um, you are you are kind of maybe you don't you, maybe you do you moonlight and stand up comedy I don't know as well but <laughs> uh, do you have any other um, uh, any other methods of disseminating your information and what would you say generally are any other stumbling blocks you have in disseminating your information? So at a point in time, we had radio programs in thirty three states and the FCT, numerous research papers show that most Nigerians or surveys and polls and whatnot show that most Nigerians get their news via radio. So radio is incredibly powerful. Again, because radio has accessibility in various languages. So there's BBC Hausa that's very widely listened to. There's some Yoruba radio platforms, Pigeon platforms. And I think, I mean, I don't know that much about the East in terms of their popular Igbo platforms. But so we also use radio a lot. Uh, so social media, radio, and we're trying to do a bit more on TV at the moment. And stumbling block, honestly, will be, I will say, ac access. Just ensuring that there's consistency and access in people getting information. Now, media in Nigeria is very controlled and very expensive, which is why, again, social media has that strength. Because all you need is data, access to data. But to get on radio, you need money. Get on TV, you need money. And those that pretty influential platforms, especially radio for us, that we think we need to do more on. Having, I mean, our radio programs are called Office of the Citizen, usually one-hour programs. 
call-in programs. So we'll provide context for the first 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and then open the phone lines and basically just take people through the very basic fact that as a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you have rights and responsibilities. And when your elected or appointed officials are not doing their jobs, you have the right to call them out. This is their phone number. Call them. I mean, numerous times I've been on radio and giving out phone numbers of officials. And people are like, eh, really? I can call them. I'm like, yeah, you can. They work for you. Start calling. Uh, how at at you, you, you're talking about you're, right now you're talking about states some some areas some uh, geopolitical zones and all do you do you typically engage with the state the state assemblies state legislatures the state governments uh, maybe even local governments as well as the federal government as well. So we've Oops. done mostly Sorry. federal because as I say at the federal level it doesn't matter if you're in Lagos. Enugu or Taraba. You're all talking about the same person. Now take it a step lower. If you're talking about the National Assembly, because all of them are congregated in Abuja, it's easy to talk about them as a block, even though your senator is different from my senator. At the state level, it's just a lot harder because if I'm talking about things happening in Lagos, the person in Taraba doesn't care or doesn't send me. So it just means that the, the noise is not as loud but it's work that needs to be done. So this year, EIA is going to be focusing a lot on building capacity at the local government level and encouraging citizens to engage their local government officials because they're closer. You don't have to travel to Abuja to engage your local government officer. So how would you talk about... So with the... With, look, I mean, it sounds interesting. Um, it sounds interesting for this reason before you... <laughs> it sounds interesting for this reason. Uh, at state levels and local local levels, it, it feels like they've become more and more redundant. Local governments pretty much are redundant in, from, from what we can see. Um, if you want to push back on that, that's fine. State governments seem to uh, also have become all roads lead to Abuja pretty much as well. Just like you were talking about that, it, they all congregate in Abuja pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it's more effective to go after them in Abuja. But it would seem like your power, your people power, is more effective uh, outside of Abuja while all these other people don't congregate in Abuja. So that's what I'm saying is it's interesting to see how that plays out because it seems more and more they've, they themselves to have also shut out the noise and just sit down in Abuja largely to uh, carry out whatever they want to carry out. Everything seems to be happening in Abuja pretty much. I mean, the the last week, for instance, as an example, is the was well, it's still ongoing the case in Rivers, which is pretty much which pretty much has been the case since this dispensation. Whether you go back to the case in Anambra and the Uba, or the whole Uza, Uza Dima thing, so it's just it's all to say that it feels like these guys congregate in Abuja, block out the noise, but the power itself it's outside of, of Abuja. So how how effective it is harnessing that power from outside of Abuja to be effective in Abuja is something I find I find interesting. So, so what we're trying to do, and I hear you, um, because obviously the people in Abuja are the people in Abuja. If you are trying to build, if you are trying to bring the force of people in Enugu and Lagos to impact what's happening in Abuja, you use the people in in Abuja. I mean, obviously, some of us in the civil society place will fly to Abuja for a protest, but obviously, you can't. The people power to use your word cannot be flown to Abuja in, in that same way. So what tends to happen is that people organize things at the state level in a sense to then put pressure up the value chain. Or you organize it simultaneously, try to organize it simultaneously across the country so there's a sense of heat in the country that federal then has to respond to. But ultimately, I think from where I sit after these years, now when I, when I started leading Enough is Enough, my theory of change was that working with Nigeria's educated elite, who are the ones that want good schools? They went to public schools, but now they can't send themselves to the schools that they went to. So they are paying for private schools. They want good roads for their cars. They want to be able to travel. They want the finer things in life. Those are the things that, in my brain, they will be willing to work to get. But I've come to realize that the educated elite and the political elite are one and the same and they are not necessarily interested in doing the work 
for Nigeria to change in the way that it should. So therefore, we have to do a lot more work in building the capacity of citizens in, at the local level, in the states, at the local government level, to understand what this construct called a democracy means. I say this, there's no way in Nigeria's education curriculum where we're taught what a democracy is. So we are running the democracy, which for a lot of people equals elections, because that's the one we make the most noise about. So we are going to vote every four years. We vote for people. There's campaign, da, 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 da. So for a lot of people, that's where it starts and stops. So the part about holding elected officials accountable is relatively new. And so doing that work, I mean, it's long play, but until people understand what it means and the power they have, because the citizen really has the most power in a democracy, they won't be able to, ex you, can't ex you can't exercise power you don't know you have. Oh, that's true. Very true. Uh, I, I see the path. It be, it's interesting as it plays out. But uh, turning to the, the judiciary, uh, most Nigerians, I mean, typically, most people don't. I, I think universally, I don't think people see it as a place of justice, maybe as a place of decision, maybe. That should be respected for some, but for others, it's just a waste of of um, of, of space to some, to some others. Um how would you assess this view and is the view justified? It's very justified. Unfortunately, we were expecting people in the judiciary to be different from the rest of society. So yes, while well, that's justified because they're meant to be above board, incorruptible, dispensing justice, wanting, wanting, wanting. But they're also human beings and the same issues apply. If I can get away with it and there are no consequences, human beings will likely do what is most convenient for them to do. And so if people's values are not challenged um, or they're not from your home, your community, like we've gotten to the point where people are, your community members are the ones that will tell you if you go to government that we didn't tell you, send you to government to go and count bridge. We sent you there to go and do something meaningful. So when that's the kind of expectations that people have of you and there are no consequences to breaking the law, then it is what it is. Yeah, that is interesting because you mean you talked about people's values, and at the same time, yeah, you're, you're accepting that the values that people have now is if we, if you get into government, people expect you to be a to be wealthy, to steal, to steal, yeah, yeah, to be wealthy overnight. Even your own parents might uh, not everybody. I'm not you in particular, but mm -hmm. of course, quite normally, your parents would mm -hmm. come into uh, insist or pray for you or swear for your spouse that. Mm -hmm. The money is not coming down and all these kind of things. So inherently the values, I don't want to get into a wider conversation about religion. I know that's not your, that's, that's more of a uh, Western conversation in terms of uh, the value of religion and, and morality and all those kind of things, because it seems like it's failing in Nigeria pretty much. Uh, there seems to be no value there. There seems to be, uh, I mean, <laughs> the, the other day I was, uh, my kid fell, our kids fell ill and, um, the only the only soccer I could get from my in-laws was that um, they saw it in a dream, and more or less like pulling me to uh, pulling me to go to some spiritualist, and, uh, and I'm and I'm looking at them like uh, they saw it in a dream. They yeah, they saw it in a dream. Like, apparently, um, they should have it, <laughs> very good observation, right? They're very good. They're like you know, saw it in a dream all of a sudden, more or less pulling me to go to to some spiritualist and other things instead of just going to the hospital. I get it. I don't live in Nigeria, but that's the kind of mentality you deal with when you deal with people in, in Nigeria. So it's, uh, it's inherently, I, I feel the value system is not what it is. Uh, if you're talking about the good book, uh, let me, let me use the word, the good book, mm -hmm. the good book you pick and choose. It depends on what you want to choose from it. It's a very interesting book as well, because if you want to do evil, you could have evil in the book. You go to the the Old Testament and all the slaughtering and the killing and but we turn this into a wider religious mm -hmm. conversation. But you get the drift. I mm -hmm. feel like people people have gravitated morally towards the more negative and more uh, the more negative aspects or parts parts of um, morality or theology or whatever you might call it that is antithetical to building a a real society. Agreed. Yeah, so it's it's something I, I don't know how you might want to combat if you do overall. Um, 
But so there were, I think there were two things that shaped our sense of values, culture. And well, religion is a part of culture, I guess, but I will separate them from culture. So when I mean culture, I take like Yoruba culture um, and then Christianity as two separate things. Now, Yoruba culture talks about the concept of omoluabi, like a well brought up child. There are things that you do. There's respect, there's integrity, there's honor that comes with you being a child that had proper, as we we'll call it, proper home training. Now, those things, in my view, are being watered down and whittling away with a mix of sort of Western values, with a mix of parents not being able to pay attention or not particularly caring, and then society not punishing the lack of those values. At least when I was growing up, those things were expected. You will be reported, you will get beaten. There was a, a social norm that shaped you into valuing these things that we don't have anymore. So that's that on one side. We're also a very to your point, very religious society that also has a bit of fetishness tied to it that's part of our cultural religions, our pagan religions, if you want to call it that. Um, so there's all those things contending for like a true, like a, what, what they call a true north, and that's what I was trying to say earlier. When there's like, lying is bad, stealing is bad. It's not a gray area. It's bad. Like, there should be consequences. But when there's those those set things are now fluid and people can now be justifying well, you see, however, but if, and all of those things, then you have the crisis that you have that the institutions that should uphold these things don't uphold them anymore. Um, essentially, so um, Nigeria is a young population, so how does, that, how does that factor in for you? Is that special? Is that problematic? Is that uh, um, uh, optimistic? What would, you th- what would you think about that? It's optimistic and problematic. I mean, it's optimistic because you have numbers to work with. And you have numbers of a demographic that want better, that are hungry, innovative ideas, just desire more out of what what life has to give them. But also problematic because it's a generation that has seen just anyhowness, as we like to call it in Nigeria. So their framing of what it is to be successful, what it is to do good, what it is to be respected, has been framed in a context of, I don't know, I don't know, fraud will be a broad thing, but just a context where people do anything to gain respect and notoriety. So the whole value of hard work and discipline and integrity and dignity in labor is not as strong. And then you have a generation that are so eager to leave the country as well. So if some of the, our best and brightest, and you can't blame them, are looking for places to go that can allow them to express their talents in its fullest capacity, it means that we're leaving behind not the best of our best, and that can't be a good thing. That's um, a, a heavy challenge, I think, uh, you're, you're suited for. Seems like you're suited for. Mm-hmm. So you, we spoke, we're talking about Nigerian universities, and am to... You 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 went to University of Lagos in the nineties, so I still remember there was um, um, there was some level of university activism at that point in time in the early nineties, some level at that point in time. Um, so how would you how do you see today's level of university activism generally? Are you disturbed about it? Being that you at least you kind of finished uh, secondary school at the point where there was still a level of it compared to now and how would you compare it? How do you see it? Does it disturb you? Do you feel it's useful? As a campus child, it disturbs me greatly. And I say that if I could clone myself, my other self would work just 100% on tertiary education in Nigeria. Because again, the same way we talked about the judiciary, students, quote unquote, activists have taken on the form and function of politicians that they've seen. So you see a student union president that has 30 aides You see them in a convoy of SUG1, SUG2, or whatever it is that they're riding up and down because the cars are gifted to them by governors who know that they'll be useful when they need to foster trouble. Last year, the National Association of Nigerian Students had their elections in Abuja and there was violence. There were guns, there were were gunshots. And part of the narrative of that is that the thugs were sponsored by the son of the sitting president because he had his own candidate. So he set up thugs to be there. His candidate didn't win, thankfully. Actually, I should go and find the one that won and have a conversation. But anyway, (laughs) 
But that tells you what we're breeding. So if the National Association of Nigerian Students cannot have an election without guns and thuggery, these are the people who will do national youth service. And then we expect them to work as election support staff. Why would they not commit fraud? Like, why would that, why would that be a thing that they would do and all of us would be surprised? Like, oh, they're just students. No, they're not just students. They're students that we've raised in this level of madness. For me, if I had money, what I want to do in the past, so student union were not just in terms of uh, university governance, but they were also the sort of ideological pole of the university. They were the ones shaping thoughts, shaping response to policies and, and issues. Right now, they are not, they're not interested in those things. They're interested in cars and money from governor and things of that nature. If I had money, I would actually build a parallel government to SUGs and universities in Nigeria. And it won't be to fight them for positional leadership. They can be students, union presidents, that's your business. We're not fighting you for that. But it will be to take on the space of ideological leadership, like thought leadership, so that they are not interested in office, but they're interested in helping students shape their thinking around what it means to be an 18-year-old Nigerian in 2024, 2025, 2026. What does that mean for you in terms of the world? What does that mean for you in terms of why, like, why you're in the university you're in? What are you doing? What are you learning? What do you want to do with your future? And lastly, a big thing for me also is that our universities cannot produce people that are productive in the current state. You cannot be paying a hundred naira to go with you, maybe not a hundred. You cannot be paying 10,000 naira to go to university and expect world-class education in 2024. It's absolutely impossible. Now, can the federal government allocate more money? Yes, certainly. But they have shown over and over and over and over and over again that they have no interest in allocating more money. And the reasons are not far-fetched. The more enlightened sensible people you have, the more that there will be a challenge to your rubbish sense of governance. Now, how university lecturers don't understand that from an ideological perspective, I don't get. So ASU is consistently going on strike, asking for more money. And I'm like, are you stupid, deaf, dumb? Which one is it? They are not going to give you more money. So just ask for your autonomy so you can actually run the school the way you run, want to and produce students that can actually think, that can actually contribute to global knowledge. Because they have labs that have equipment. They can actually do science, do research, find the cure for something because they're going to school to learn. Not, yeah, as you can tell, it's a very sore point for me. So ASU is just, for me, just a very useless bunch of people because they spend so much time just asking. For, it's just, For them, it's just about government needs to give us more money. Government is rich. Yeah, I understand it from an ideological perspective. But my point is you're wasting decades of people's lives, you're wasting decades of building bodies of knowledge, you're wasting decades of building the academic institution in Nigeria, because you're constantly chasing government for more money. They'll call you into a room, pacify you with a few million, and then you go back and say, yes, they promised us money, you go back to work. Six months later, you come back again and say you're protesting. Are you not tired? Like, how does this make sense? Who said uh, stupidity is not stupidity? It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's like Asu. That's that's madness. Madness. Asu, that's why I call them mad. That's Asu. So, yeah. <laughs> You've asked how all of you. My next question was, how did you see, how do you see educational uh, reforms? But uh, it's a good way. Uh, being more autonomous would be, I guess, a way to go about it, I guess, overall. But, I mean, you, you deeply, you deeply, uh, you know, coming to the end of this, but you deeply get involved, you are deeply involved in Nigeria, Nigerian youths, and all that. How, yourself, how do you avoid getting, uh, falling into despair? You know, you're talking about your mom and rightfully, almost certainly rightfully so, how most people have needed her services right now in Nigeria. How do you go about uh, not falling into that kind of despair that you're just digging a, you're digging a hole at the beach and trying to fill up the ocean into the, into, uh, into, the, into the hole that you dug at the beach kind of despair? Very good question. Um, to be honest, I would really say it's my faith because I'm very clear that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for this season in my life. And so being despair, being in despair is actually not part of the equation. And secondly, I think I'm also too angry at this regret to be in despair because I think being in despair would mean that they are winning. So I think mentally, 
being in Spain is, is not an option. Well, something I was going to add about Nigeria before I ask you the last question, well, about Nigerian education, do you see the, you, know, you talked about being on more autonomous, but I was going to talk about, I was going to look at how, how do you see the curriculum, essentially the curriculum, you don't have stuff like civics, you don't have, you kind of touched on it in terms of how um, university professors, well, I don't know, university governing, uh, uh, governing councils, but they're the ones that actually are in charge of the curriculums, right? Mm -hmm. Governing councils, academic departments, professors are just brought in to carry out what they decide, how they don't see that a more vibrant, uh, maybe teaching style curriculum, but how, how do you yourself, how do you see the curriculum? Do you see the absence of civics in Nigeria? Uh, I mean, I, we, we see it in other countries, if you, if you compare, if you go to other countries have a certain level of civics in terms of teaching um, history and other things that will help build more uh, wholesome people overall. How do you see that in Nigeria? Do you, do, you, do you notice that absence? Do you think it's it's not the biggest issue? Do you think it's a problem? Oh, certainly. As I said earlier, you are running a democracy in a place where people don't understand what it means to be in a democracy. And especially if you don't, let's not forget, given our own cultural context, where quite a number of our communities were quite hierarchical, uh, monarchical as well. So you're now running this place where people are voting. I mean, even though I mean, there's some communities where people did have, could really put their monarchs under fire, but it was, it would have been a, such a, an exceptional case. Whereas in democracies, constantly putting your elected officials on, under fire is powerful course. Actually, you know what, I'll, I'll land on this. I always say there are three things that influence how Nigerians behave for the most part. One is religion, because re religion is also very deferential. So you defer to your church leader, your imam, or whatever. And there's a, quite a bit of programming in, in religion that's scripted. Then there's culture that's also very deferential. So I'm a Yoruba girl. I mean, if I'm talking to a 70, 80 year old senator, there's a certain level of respect that's expected, certain level of deference. And I can't really tell him, sir, well, you stole this money. Why? <laughs> Because that would be considered rude. So um, there's that that shapes how we engage people in authority by virtue of age and by virtue of the fact that they're in authority. And then lastly, military rule. For a certain generation, not wanting government wahala, trouble, was very much a real thing. So you, government is them. You stayed away because nobody wanted to die and you didn't want them to send you to jail. So those three things are playing at the back of our minds at different degrees that we might not acknowledge. So, um, to your question, so what was your question? My question is just in terms of the, the educational uh, ah, content, right, how does that, yeah. Yeah. So curriculum, gen yeah. So generally, I mean, our curriculum is outdated because the people that go, I mean, I went to school decades ago, the people that go to school say it is outdated compared to what they can see online and whatnot. But the absence of civics or an absence of teaching about democracy, even though they said they brought it back in some form, but the lack of intentionality of teaching people about their rights and responsibilities is, I mean, it's very intentional. You don't need people knowing their rights and responsibilities where they can challenge you. So you suppress it as much as you can. It's pretty big. It's, it's pretty simple. As I say, it makes sense from a government perspective, it makes perfect sense what they're doing. Makes sense. <laughs> I guess so. Well, it's interesting though. Um, the, the other thing I for, for the last week, the other thing I was going, I want you to chime in on is how, what you think about the structure of Nigeria currently. And we talked about, military uh, dictatorships, which in my opinion, I don't think, um, I think dictatorships are not always bad, not generally even bad in my opinion. It all depends on your luck or the draw to some degree. Most societies, in fact, modern society, modern um, European societies came into the Middle Ages from what, the Roman Empire, which ended up being a dictatorship to some degree. Well, I mean, they were kind of a republic for the longest time, right? But even in the modern times, you've had dictatorships that have done well. Singapore is a good example. And you have, you've had those that have done badly to, to a large degree, maybe not mm -hmm. Korea. So, but today we have a structure that is akin to a dictatorship. The Nigerian leadership is more of a kingdom. Mm -hmm. That is my, the way I see it done. So how, how do you see, what do you think of any kind of restructuring or educating people on those kind of the possibilities that could exist in a that could exist maybe in restructuring or not restructuring or working within the system and all that. 
So a couple of things, restructuring and dictatorship are two kind of different conversations. So quickly as we as we round up, restructuring for me, I think is critical because different parts of Nigeria, we're a federation. So we should operate as one. Let every state, every region be operating at its own pace. Don't use your own kaga to come and disturb my own life. And let's stop focusing as much on the center because each each area is forced to self-develop and look within around how, how you can survive. I may very much look forward to a day in the future where two states are going to sit down and have a conversation about uh, mergers and acquisition, how they will work together to improve their lot. So that's that on restructuring. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a critical conversation. Why not the same? Um, we think differently. Our laws are different. Uh, the, is it the penal code in the north versus whatever in the south? So quite a number of different things that influence how we see the world and how we run our systems. That's one. Two, what's going on with my brain? You asked about restructuring and something. Oh, yes, dictatorships. Yes. So we're in a dictatorship. No, but we're in a democracy. So they might feel, they might act like dictators. But I think the part about it is when people don't understand their power. I will send you an image. So when you are doing... That maybe you can, I don't even know, since this is not visual, people can see it. But anyway, I'll, I'll send you a, a visual that you can use. But what people right. don't understand their power is how it feels like a dictatorship. Because if you understand that you are, as a citizen, you are the most powerful person in democracy, you will act differently. And the fact that we've actually ceded our power to the judiciary and they're now making judgments, illegal judgments. I mean, and I, and I say that and I always find it funny. When the Supreme Court of a country is making judgments that violate the laws of a country, then you know that there's a problem. Because the Supreme Court is the highest body. Nobody can challenge their judgments, but they've given judgments that clearly violate the law of the land. Then what? So when you see things like that, it's citizens really understanding that they have power. Now, if, does that lead to a revolution? Does that lead to problems on the streets in society? Possible. But yeah, we do need... We do need a, we need an awakening, an awakening that threatens the political elite. That's fair. Not... That's fair. Mm-hmm. Where do you see for our last last thing? Where do you see Nigeria in ten years? Where do you see or be your mm. is it optimistic, pessimistic, combination, uh, nihilistic, doesn't exist? Where do you see it in ten years? I think a combination of optimistic and I mean Nigeria is always a if we don't receive sense, there will be disaster. So if we receive sense, it will be good. If we don't receive sense, I don't know what will be happening, but it won't be good. So it's best so to you, receive sense. So you see Nigeria as uh, it's best to receive sense. So just receive sense for ten years time would be great for us. Is that is that that's some to that? That's if we receive sense. <laughs> Do you that's think Nigeria will receive sense? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I mean, what you seen? Man, you could. I don't know. I'm just saying. I don't know. But you I take it day know, by day. You take it day by day. Exactly. I'm not making predictions, yeah, because it's not. It's not a anything. And I think that's one of the things that I also know. Anything can trigger anything. Like something can happen today that scatters everything. So I don't. That's fair. That's fair. Well, thank you for coming on. Well, I don't know if you'd be happy with this, but uh, you are a very energetic and fire cracking person. <laughs> I actually enjoyed this.